Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello everyone, fans of the world of paleoanthropology. Today we are here on another episode of The Story of Us with a very special guest and we're handing it over to her for her to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Dr. Kirsty Graham. I use she, her and they, them pronouns. I'm a research fellow at the University of St. Andrews and I spend most of my time studying how other great, great apes use gestures to communicate. And that is incredible and one of the many reasons that I really wanted you on the show. And, you know, for those who may not know, before I got into paleoanthropology, I really wanted to be a sign language interpreter, um, ASL. And ASL is much more than just gestures. You know, it is a, for those, again, who may not know, sign language is actually a fully developed language. Now, is that what we're talking about when we're talking about gestures and other great apes? No, it's not. And that's a really important distinction and one that I also really like to make. Um, we are talking about a system of gestures that they use. Um, as you said, sign languages are language like spoken and written languages are. Um, and what we're looking at in other great apes are these gestures that they use that do have meaning, but they don't have this expansive vocabulary. They don't have this structured grammar that we see in human languages. And so there's some important differences there between gesture and language. Humans also use gesture as well. And we use gesture alongside our spoken and signed languages. Um, I might wave to say hi. I'm gesturing right now as I'm speaking to sort of illustrate and keep things moving. So it's something that we also we also use a lot of gestures um, alongside language. Absolutely. So where did not only your interest in this particular topic come from, but how did interest in this topic come out in general? Was there a point where someone observed a specific creature animal um, making a gesture and they went, hmm, I'm going to study this or what? How did that come about? Yeah, so I think my interest in it emerges in like not a dissimilar way as the field itself. When I started undergrad, I was really interested in doing philosophy and linguistics. Um, and I didn't realize that you could take those approaches and think about other species and their communication as well. And when we're thinking about this field, there's sort of these studies in the 30s through to the 60s and 70s, on one hand, of these enculturated great apes, where people are interested in seeing if we can teach them to learn language. And at the same time, there's these field sites being set up, set up with wild great apes, and starting to see that they're using gestures to communicate with one another. And these two sides really informed one another. Oh, wow. That that's amazing that they were able to see the distinction and that they are able to, as you said, begin to inform each other. So where did your personal interest in this come from? Like, were you, where, what's your background in? What did you go to school for? Yeah, so I, as I said, I went to school thinking I wanted to do philosophy and linguistics, right. wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for undergrad, really, um, and didn't have anyone in my family with an academic background and didn't really know what kinds of things were available. Um, and then I got to undergrad and I did a liberal arts degree. So I did a whole bunch of a lot of really like broad general topics. Um, 
and became interested in understanding sort of evolutionary processes in animal behavior and animal communication. And I had an excellent advisor there who put me in touch with my then next my PhD supervisor and she was like if I like if I was to do a PhD again this is the person I would approach Mm -hmm. I didn't know what a PhD was beyond like these people who were teaching me at my cute little liberal arts college Mm -hmm. (laughs) all had PhDs and they seemed to be having a good time and so I emailed my um, prospective PhD supervisor um, and was like, you seem cool. Uh, let's do this. Like, would you be interested in supervising this research? Um, and so I think that was, I went into a PhD quite naive. Um, but I would encourage people thinking about doing a PhD to sort of email around potential supervisors. I think that's really a cool way of getting into it. And so then I sort of, yeah, uh, this interest was emerging from like finding out that you can look at language or language like communication in other species. I got to do some field work with bonobos as a research assistant. I like found them a really cool, interesting model species for looking at gesture, and it kind of snowballed from there. So, when was you mentioned you got to do field work with or? I don't know if it was field work because it could have been actually if you go to let's say a captivity scenario like a zoo is that field work or is that that's a really interesting question I think that primatology specifically I don't know about like the rest of like anthropology or like archaeology or paleontology what they would consider but primatology is like quite um not snobbish but like particular (laughs) about what is field work right Uh and there's this like it field work is held in like this really high esteem as something that like you go to and you prove yourself by doing this field work and so personally i think i would include like staying at a zoo or at a sanctuary and like doing that sort of on-site research with captive apes i would personally include that as field work um it's still a type of data collection it's still very involved especially if you're still staying on site for it but yeah mm-hmm. field work i think holds this very mm-hmm. like particular place that i think primatologists <laughs> probably need to interrogate a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, when was the first time that you conducted what maybe other people would consider field work then? Yeah. Uh I went to Wamba, which is a bonobo research site in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2012 to 2013 for 6 months. Um I was a research assistant for Zimona Pika and the, her then PhD student, Paul Kuchenbuch. And I flew to Germany to pick up equipment for them, for them to describe the methods and sort of give a little bit of brief training. And then I flew down to Kinshasa and met with um, two Japanese researchers who were working at the site too, um, Professor Takeshi Furichi. Um, and Shinya Yamamoto and it was it was not my first actually so that was my first great ape fieldwork experience Um, but I had previously done some research um, in Costa Rica with sea turtles and then with um, spider monkeys and howler monkeys and capuchins very cool very cool and what it did you think of the field work? Was it more difficult than you anticipated? Was it what you expected? Because I know, you know, when we're talking about field work, obviously there's different challenges depending on what field we're discussing. And of course, when people think of apes and field work, they immediately go to Jane Goodall staying in Gombe for years on end. What's field work like these days when we're studying great apes? 
It's really varied. So since then, I've stayed and worked at um, briefly at Bodongo in Uganda, um, at Tankoko in S North Sulawesi in Indonesia, and at Fungoli in Senegal. Mm -hmm. And it's striking how different each field site is and I think a lot of it comes down to what the managers are prioritizing and also what resources are available depending on like transportation and that kind of thing mm -hmm. access to the field site um, so at Wamba it was like far away from like a mobile internet tower so it was all satellite internet so from that perspective communication is quite limited but then right. it's a really comfortable um like field work like field station building um there's um sort of like staff are employed from families across the group of villages and um for like research staff for like um uh, maintenance and cooking and cleaning staff and so it's a quite a well-resourced field site okay that makes sense so there's definitely a give and take depending on which site you're at that makes yeah. perfect sense yeah I enjoy when a field site prioritizes food <laughs> 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 and making sure that researchers well that all staff working there have like good food and enough of it because that's something that I think gets compromised at some like mm -hmm. field sites and so yeah that's my <laughs> that's one of the things that I look for in a field site <laughs> absolutely I can definitely see why <laughs> so when working in the field I'm sure you've garnered some interesting stories is there a story that you would like to share with us that maybe you know you've remembered you will remember the rest of your life for one that was just funny or something that surprised you. Is there anything that mm. a story you'd like to share about your field work? It could be something, I don't know. What's something interesting? I have I've so I visited some friends recently and uh they have a nine-year-old and he was asking me about all of the like cool, dangerous, interesting animals that I'd seen while on field work. Um and one that always stands out to me was when I was working in Indonesia. Um, we would often come across these reticulated pythons, these like huge, like two to six meter long snakes um and they're usually very calm and resting and like in the the nooks of these buttress roots um but there was that I, I have two stories about them one was on my first day um first in the first week that i was at tankoko and we we're following the macaques and we heard this like crashing in the plants up ahead. And from the movement, it looked like something really big was moving in there. And I was like, okay, it's like bush pigs. I know exactly what to do. Like I climbed these like two small like saplings <laughs> side by side to each other. Yeah. And meanwhile, the two other researchers I was with, they had just ran back down the hill. And I was like, you can't, like, if it's bush pigs and if they're going to come towards me, the advice is to climb up. Uh -huh. So I climbed <laughs> up. And when I was up there, it was bush pigs. And it was four or five of them. And they had this huge python. And they were just, like, wrestling and tearing apart this huge python that I guess they had, like, come across. And then, yeah. 
like were taking it out as a threat and it was like so interesting and the macaques were sort of on the other side of the trees and I was holding onto these two like saplings and I was like well now that I've climbed up I just have to wait this one out um, and so it was like it was very cool to watch um, the macaques were interested in watching it it was really neat um, and then the other time that we found well We've found several pythons, but there's this particular time where the macaques were really, really sort of like interested in checking it out and they were getting quite close to it. And it started to like climb up this tree. And I film all of my videos for the macaques to like look at what gestures they're using and how they're communicating, whether they engage in joint attention. And like, this is just the perfect scenario to look for joint attention because they are focused on this like third object, this Python, and they're also communicating with one another. But I'm narrating this video and I am like so surprised at seeing this Python climbing a tree that all I can say is like, the python is climbing a tree it's still climbing like the macaques are around it like trying to id the macaques but it's like i'm I, i'm like so used to narrating like these like social interactions of like who's mm -hmm. approaching who and what and i was just like flabbergasted <laughs> at this huge like five meter long python and they kind of coil and slinky their way up a tree right mm -hmm. right those are some fascinating stories. I'm just picturing in my head what you're talking about and seeing. And my goodness, that's that's some, that's intense. That's very intense. Mm -hmm. um, so shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk more about your work specifically. So when we're talking about gestures in primates, is there some is there a species that is more proficient? at gesturing or is it something that's more universal across the board of the usage yeah so we see a lot of gesture usage in other great ape species um, and i think we have to recognize that we've studied it a lot more in other mm -hmm. great apes and particularly in chimpanzees um, but chimpanzees and bonobos who are both really closely related and are equally related to humans. Um, they both use these like sets of around 70 gestures, depending on how you split them. Um, and it's mostly shared. There's some differences, I think, that are interesting between the chimpanzee and bonobo populations that we've studied so far, where the chimps seem to be using more objects in their gestures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting, too, because chimpanzees tend to use more tools than bonobos do, at least in the wild. Right, right. Um, and we're now sort of expanding to look at gorillas and orangutans. And again, we're seeing this really big overlap in this sort of shared repertoire of gestures that they're using, but with some sort of subtle differences i think we have um there's a phd student in our group charlotte grund who's been working with the mountain gorillas at Wendy, mm. and she's finding they're using a lot of like different contact gestures where they'll hold right. their bodies next to each other or over one another in different ways um the orangutans are using a lot of the same gestures but it's a lot of like mother infant interactions and right. they spend all their time together. And so they're almost like responding before the gestures finished. So we're finding the gestures are a little bit shorter or like truncated, right. but it seems to be really shared across the great apes. And is there, um, when we're talking about using gestures to communicate, do they accompany it with vocalizations or is it sometimes does that occur or is it usually one or the other? They do sometimes um, accompany vocalizations. I think we get a lot of gesture only or like gesture sequences in like very short like one-on-one -on -one, hmm. like social interactions like requesting grooming is often like 
they'll do a big loud scratch or raise an arm or present a body part and it's quite a quick and simple gestural um, communication. There's in play, often you get like a play face and this sort of like play, like laughter or sort mm -hmm. of grunting that comes alongside their gestures. Um, I think that's probably one of the more common like combinations that they use. Okay. And for my better understanding, I'm sure for those who are watching, listening, to consider something a gesture. It's not something where they just went hello, like one time. It's something that you're seeing repeated in the same species and the same animals, correct? Exactly. Okay. It's a little trickier um, compared to thinking about like studying chimpanzee or bonobo vocal communication. If it's produced with a vocal apparatus, you're like, this is a vocalization. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas gesture is produced with like the limbs and the body and the head. And these are all like, these can all be used for different non-communicative actions. So you have to tease apart when is a body moving for some other purpose and when is a body moving for communication. And so we have these, like, we call them intentionality criteria mm -hmm. and for a a gesture to be intentional it just means it's about something right it's goal directed it's a movement that is produced by one ape to get another ape to do something and so we're looking for gesture we're looking for movements that are used socially that are directed towards another individual maybe they're making sure that the other individual is watching if it's a silent visual gesture or they'll use a tactile or contact gesture or an audible gesture if they're not um, and then we're looking for like yes as you say like these multiple uses and also that the recipient is reacting or that the signaler is waiting for the recipient to react and is persisting if they don't react and so we've got these sort of set of criteria that build intentionality into our definition of what a gesture is in a way that doesn't necessarily happen for vocalizations. Right, right. And how long, how much field work does it take to observe these gestures? How Do you know how many hours you have logged in total? Ooh, I, you know, <laughs> at some point at the end of my PhD, I had checked a lot of hours um <laughs> i have so i have worked with the bonobos for a total of 18 months oh, with wow. the crested macaques i did 12 months um but i've just done a field season at fongoli with the chimpanzees there and mm. i was there for only six weeks and I filmed some of the best gesture footage <laughs> that I've ever filmed. And so much of it depends on the visibility um, right. and the time of year and how much, like how cohesive the group is and how much time they're spending together. Because the period that I was at Fongoli in Senegal, so this is a savanna grassland like mosaic um, habitat it was the very end of the dry season so all of the grass had died down so whenever they're walking across like between the forested areas it's clear visibility the group was really cohesive they were spending like we saw almost every individual almost every day and so I was filming so many so many gestures and a lot of displays um and yeah, it really, it depends so much on the social group and also like time of year and visibility and things. Absolutely. So earlier you were mentioning that chimps seem to use gestures more than bonobos and that they also use tools more than bonobos. Um, keeping with that possible correlation, were you seeing more gestures of Fongoli? Because for those who may not know, the chimps at Fongoli are quite well known for using tools, um, which we had Dr. Jill Pruitt on the show a few episodes ago. So she was talking about that. But 
do you think there were more gestures there because of that correlation or do you think it's unrelated? So to clarify, I think the chimpanzees are using more gestures with objects. Okay. So they do like they'll approach with an object in their mouth. Um, okay. They'll sort of slap objects and like hit objects together and those kinds of things. And I think I definitely, well, so I think I'm going to take the case of buttress drumming as an interesting example, right? Because this is one of the, one of the questions I'm interested in poking at is where do we distinguish between a display and a gesture? Mm -hmm. Um, but the chimpanzees at Fongoli are doing a lot of buttress drumming. It was incredible to film. They're also using like hollowed baobab trees to drum on as well, um, which is acoustically really interesting. Um, and they are, I was interested actually in how often they're greeting one another. And I think greeting is a really interesting context that seems to me to be a key difference in when bonobos and chimps are using gestures. Um, and I think what was interesting was that in a lot of ways, the chimpanzees at Fung Fungoli were doing a lot of social behavior that was not dissimilar from bonobos at Womba. Like mm -hmm. I saw, um, females forming coalitions to chase males away uh the highest ranking male at fongoli at the moment his mom is like supporting him in his mm -hmm. fights and the females were a lot more central um to the chimp group than to like kalinzu which was the east african chimpanzee group that i worked with for three months um and so there were a lot of ways in which socially they had some overlap with bonobos and again like wamba i was seeing almost all these individuals almost every day and yet they were still greeting each other so it wasn't only we've been separated for a couple of days the parties have rejoined one another like big fission fusion events let's greet but like we've woken up in the morning or we've been traveling at different ends of the group and i've mm -hmm. just seen you again let's greet and i think that's that's really interesting and there are some really cool potentially novel gestures in those greetings and in those what does a greeting look like usually yeah so i think a greeting well so for a greeting i would say typically one chimpanzee is approaching from a distance to another chimpanzee um often this is another context where you get those vocalizations and gestures alongside each other often there's some grunting maybe pant grunting um some barks um, they will sometimes touch each other's genitals, um, touch each other's like mouths or faces. So they'll approach one another. There's this sort of communication and then they'll separate again or they'll continue mm -hmm. traveling together. And it's one of these interesting ones if we're thinking about meaning, because the way I would typically look at meaning in ape gestures is to see what the change in behavior is. So like I like we're not playing i shake this branch we start playing this branch shake was to start the play greetings one of these kind of difficult ones because you can see that something socially has happened in this communication but the behavior before and after is typically the same they were traveling and they're still traveling right right and what do you think is the most complex thing that you've seen communicated gesturally? That you, well, of course, when we're looking at these gestures, we have to figure out as well what they're saying, as <laughs> so the chimps and other animals. So what do you think is the most complicated thing you've been able or anyone's been able to decipher about mm. um, chimp gesture, gestural communication? Yeah. I think there's maybe... The question of complexity is in itself <laughs> complex <laughs> because you can have like these complex signals, right? So um, 
like uh, display might be that you drag a branch and then you throw a rock and then you pick up another branch and you drag another branch and you have this mm -hmm. like display that's a sequence of maybe like 20 different elements that's really complicated and it's kind of you running around making a big noise letting others know you're there and then you have these maybe what would be considered meaningfully complex communications where I would maybe think about something like a consortship where you start off by like your first few gestures and signals are to attract an individual to the edge of the group to start traveling together to follow each other but at the same time you're using gestures that are used for like sexual solicitation like copulation alongside this so it's this kind of considering of a long-term goal where you have maybe each of the gestures in the moment is working towards approximate goal that they're following mm. each other they're following each other but you have a longer term goal um of like consortship and copulation where i think you get some interesting complexity in there um i think often we have there's a phd student in our group um alexandra safrahin who's looking at linguistic laws mm -hmm. um like zips or men's wrath laws that are considering compression and we do find that like the most commonly used gestures are used sort of singly um and in some cases they are shorter than other than the gestures that are used less frequently Okay, that makes sense. And where do you see this part of the field in the next five years? What do you think is coming? What will be discerned? So if we go back to how we're looking at meaning, we're looking at those changes in behavior. But if I take my overall data set from my PhD where I coded like, 4,000 bonobo gestures. There were 2,600 of those that achieved a change in behavior. So there's still maybe like a third of the data set that were not successful mm -hmm. or were they? Question mark. <laughs> like, so I think we're going to be now that we've spent like a lot of time establishing what the gesture types mean and like can be used towards we can start to pick at those gestures that weren't successful and ask like does it seem to be a lack of motivation from the recipient could it be misunderstanding like that would be really interesting are there some gestures that are never successful um, and that might be used towards something like declarative um, or something that doesn't need a change in behavior. I think that's going to be really interesting. I also would like to see us incorporate a better way of looking at body posture, because I think that's something that's quite important for the apes communication as well. Um, and different measures of like emotional arousal. Um, there's some cool new thermal imaging work um, that's starting to be done that's looking at sort of like what emotional state the apes might be in when they're producing communication um, and also sort of methods to automate more of the video coding like it's really <laughs> obvious I think how much video it takes right. and it takes so long to manually code it um, and any ways that we can start to automate that is going to bring these bigger data sets right. and make them more usable more quickly. Um, and that could be quite cool. Bigger collaborative projects then become possible. Right. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting things. I'm sure with all those large data sets and all the video footage that possibly AI might be able to help you if you've looked into that at all. Um, very, very cool stuff going on there. So working in the field, you know, with primates and everything is a lot of people's dream. 
it's something that a lot of people hear about, they really want to do, but for one ways one reason or another, it's hard to achieve. What advice do you give to prospective students or maybe, you know, even some young kids who might be watching? What can they do to set themselves on a path that will get them to a situation similar to yours? Yeah, there are a lot of things. And I think there are a lot of skills that are really useful and useful for a lot of different jobs as well. I guess I'm thinking specifically things like learning other languages. I grew up in uh, Canada and I did French immersion and learning French has been incredibly valuable for working in Central and West mm -hmm. Africa. Um, and it also gives a toehold to then um, like also learn other languages. Um, so learning other languages, I think like can't be <laughs> under, like <laughs> I can't understate that enough how valuable that is. Um, I think considering like what experiences you can frame in relevant ways, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think if you can also, also like look for paid experiences <laughs> um, and for any like PIs and lab managers out there listening to this pay people <laughs> for <laughs> experiences. Um, but like looking close to home for something that you can do um, and get paid for and that is also relevant. So using sort of similar data collection techniques like in like a national park project where you live that can then be um, used for great apes. Um, there's lots of, I think, connecting with people. I get people emailing me regularly, like asking for my input, like reaching out to people is really good. Um, there are specific mentorship programs like the Animal Behavior Collective that can match you with a mentor. Um, that's really helpful. I think I always try to balance advice for individuals with sort of structural things that I would like to see change about research and academia and universities to make it mm -hmm. so that it's more accessible for individuals <laughs> to join, Absolutely. Um, which is a tough one. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So at this point, I would like to give you a chance to impart any other wisdom, knowledge, or anything that you would like to share to our listeners and viewers. Uh, I'm going to hand over the floor to you. If there's anything you want to say. Um, I think that in the last few years in particular, um, I have really started to think more about um, the risks of conducting research and mm. the ethics of conducting research um, and how we like consider both of these early on. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that I didn't think about, things like being LGBTQ plus and right. traveling to certain places. Um, I've had cases where I have been the one to tell students that, you know, it's this country has anti-gay laws. Um, so like, here are the steps that we can take. Um, but also, also the ethics of like, who gets to conduct research and how do we conduct research? I think I went into studying wild primates thinking about the ethics from their perspective and how do we like minimize um, our impact on non-human primates 
in terms of like studying them in captivity versus the wild, habituating, provisioning, like distance, what are the different ways that we make it ethical for them? Um, but I am spending a lot more time thinking about whether it is ethical for me to be the person to study mm. non-human great apes and how I might like improve my practice and make it possible for like people living in primate range countries um, to be the researchers and for me to be in an assistive or like collaborative role. Right, right. Which is definitely where a lot of people are trending towards in the field, just training uh, people who are there to do the work and then supporting them, which I think is a great way that we as a field can move forward and something important that we all should consider and work on ethically. <laughs> and with that... I think it is a great place for us to conclude this wonderful episode. It has been absolutely great hearing from you and learning about gestures and primates and chimps. It, you know, I am endlessly surprised and amazed at this field and everything we can learn from it. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your portion of the field with the world of paleoanthropology. Thank you so much, Seth. It's been really fun. Absolutely. And we will see you next time. All right, guys. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Yeah.